The communication world in which we live is based on symbols, right? Sometimes it's literal symbols like the ones you see on the screen here. But really, as we're going to talk about, all communication is symbolic. So the words that we use, the letters that we have, a language like that, that's all symbolic as well, as well as our gestures. Everything is symbolic. So if we're going to really study media and artifacts through critical media studies, we have to consider uh, the use of symbols in those artifacts as well, which is where we come into rhetorical analysis. Rhetorical analysis is a particular type of critical lens that we can use in critical media studies. So that's what we're going to examine today. What is rhetorical analysis? How is it used? And, and so forth. So rhetorical analysis simply examines artifacts in relation to the effort to use symbols to influence and move the audience. So what symbols are a part of that artifact? How are they used? Why were they chosen and so forth? You know, so artifacts are full of symbols. And so we're going to examine uh, in rhetorical analysis what those symbols are intended to represent, what they do represent, what action they may take and, or make an audience take or, or push an audience toward, right? Philip Pullman said, everything has meaning if we could only read it, right? Everything has a meaning if only we could read it. And that's what we're doing in rhetorical analysis, understanding that every choice, every item included in that artifact, everything used is uh, part of a message there and has a meaning. So the major premises of rhetorical analysis start with, as I mentioned, all communication is symbolic. Everything about communication is symbolic. Even the letters that you see on the screen here really are just symbols. Uh, they represent something. They represent an idea. And collectively together, when they're placed in this order, they represent a specific idea, right? That's how we form words and sentences and so forth. But whether it's the letters on the screen, whether it's your gesturing, you know, okay, or, or whatever it is you're doing, um, whether it's, uh, you know, an emoji or a symbol you're using, a graphic emoji like that or graphic symbol like that, all communication is symbolic in essence, right? It's just representative of some other idea. Meaning then is specific to an individual. When we come across those symbols and all communication is symbolic, we make meaning of it. We interpret it as individuals, and that's going to be unique to every person. Meaning is specific to an individual based on your frame of reference and all kinds of other factors, but meaning is specific to that individual. Some people see the same word, see the same symbol, and have different reactions to it or different interpretations of it because meaning is specific to an individual. We also know that symbols are often grouped together. And there are a variety of ways that this happens, that symbols are grouped together and used in conjunction with one another. So, for example, you could have a cluster of symbols. In this advertisement for this vehicle, you see that we have a cluster. We have contrasting things happening in this in this image, right? There are uh, animals and, and the idea of being out in the wild and that this vehicle can handle that type of thing. But it's also appropriate for the city life. We have the imagery of people in the city and, you know, dressed up. And so it has both the ability to be classy and live in that world and to be wild out with the animals. Right? That's what, you know, so, and then we have the vehicle itself. There's a cluster of multiple um, symbols at work here, right? So we have a cluster of symbols. We can do that with symbols. We also have uh, the ability to use form and structure and, and pattern in the way that we use symbols. So we see this in the media oftentimes through like procedural shows like CSI, which have kind of a specific formula that they use, right? When they're, when you watch a show like CSI or NCIS or really anything like that, we, we expect it to unfold in a certain way because there's a form to that particular kind of program. Um, so they use those symbols in a specific way, in a specific pattern um, for those types of procedural shows and, and, and other shows like that as well. We also then can divide it into genres. We use symbols to, to group things into genres. So we have for movies, for example, we have horror movies and we have comedies and we have rom-coms. We have dramas. Those are all different genres of movies, right? I would argue that Hallmark has its own genre of movie in our house. They're very, very popular and they're very, there's very much a form there, but they're very, um, there's a very appeal to a very specific kind of audience and they have the specific genre that they've uh, made for themselves. The Hallmark movie deserves its own category as far as I'm concerned. Um, but then we also have the basic idea of a narrative, right? A narrative happens within uh, rhetoric. 
um, as, as Burke would tell us, if you, if you study Burke, right, we have the story, we have narration, we have a voice, we have discourse, we have this narrative that unfolds as part of rhetoric as well, and that there's uh, identifiable elements um, when they're grouped together in that way. So there are a variety of ways that we can examine um, symbols and that they are oftentimes grouped together. In a contemporary sense, we need to consider a few things. First of all, that, uh, that now more than ever, symbols can be used for what we call affect. Affect, right? How does this make us feel? How does this make us respond physiologically and emotionally and different things like that? So um, now we can literally get that affect. You know, when you're watching a horror movie and the, the killer's creeping in somewhere and you know they're around or a mystery or something like that, and the hair may stand up on, on your arms, right? That would be affect, right? How does this... How do these symbols make us react physically and, and what do they kind of prompt us to do? Um, we saw the same thing as well, if you are familiar at all with the idea of uh, Woodstock 99, that concert, um, it's kind of a revival of the Woodstock, uh, the original Woodstock and all these bands were there. One band in particular, Limp Biscuit, played right? and things were getting rowdy and they played their song Break Stuff and people literally started to break stuff. It had such a, an impact on the crowd that people were going nuts. And there were, there were not only, you know, lots of physical destruction, but there was you know, sexual assaults and different, you know, people getting beat up and things like that because the, the, you know, they were responding to that song, not only the lyrics, but the, the, the rhythm and the music and just the, the, the general vibe. And it just caused this kind of mob mentality that had this affect, right? The symbology there though, it can have a, a, a real, it can manifest itself in a real way. Uh, we also think about aesthetic um, and how things look, you know, and, and we're getting more and more of this as we as we advance technology in the way to to really increase exposure to these things. So when we talk about aesthetic, we're talking about things like color and lighting and editing and movement framing and sound and all of these things. So you're going to look for one kind of aesthetic, for example, in an Adam Sandler movie, you know, in the classic Happy Gilmore's got one kind of, there's a, there's a style, there's a, a way that, that it's shot and presented and framed and a way that the characters are, are uh, portrayed here through aesthetic, the way they dress and things like that. That's different, for example, from a Batman movie. A Batman movie is going to have a very different tone, a very different mood based on the way that it looks. It's going to be darker. The explosions are going to be huge and it's going to be, you know, framed in a certain way so that you see things differently. And it's just shot differently, right? Those, that aesthetic is very different uh, for those movies. And, and so that's, you know, choices that were made there that we're going to look at in terms of a rhetorical analysis. Uh, the same thing is true. You know, I grew up in the 90s, so I'm a, I'm a Gen X kid and I grew up on grunge music. I was there for the, the whole thing in grunge music, right? So you had Nirvana, you had Alice in Chains, and, the, and there was a very specific look. There was the torn jeans and the plaid shirts and the baggy clothes, right? And then there was also this idea of wear whatever you want, because that's the whole idea of, you know, kind of this anti-establishment thing. But there was definitely a look. You could tell who were the, the kids that were into grunge at that time, who were the people that were into grunge. They dressed a certain way and had a particular attitude, but they had that aesthetic going for them too. And you can see that, you know, we would identify people who were into the goth stuff, right? And the, or the black and things like that it was, you know, part of that as well. But so we see different aesthetics for people trying to fit into different genres. And that's, that's part of rhetorical analysis as well that we're going to examine. So, okay. So now we have this idea of what is rhetorical analysis. Let's take a look at some of the common questions. And let me just say, once again, we're just scratching the surface here. These are some basic questions, some broad, broad questions. There's much more involved in rhetorical analysis than this just, but we're just trying to give you an idea here. So common questions include things like what symbols are used? What symbols can you identify as part of this, this uh, artifact that you're looking at? What are the symbols that are there? What do they represent? What do, what do you think they're intended to, to do or to be and to represent? What are there? Is there an idea that there's, that they're, uh, you know, um, uh, showcasing and, and why are those symbols there and not others? Why were they chosen? Again, why are they there? Why are other symbols not included? What, you know, what, what was left out? That can be important too. Uh, but what, why were they chosen in, in, uh, in favor of other possible symbols that could be used there? And what's the desired effect or outcome? What do you think the, the person is, is trying to do here with these things? What is it that they're, they're hoping to accomplish by putting these symbols together then? Okay. So these are some of the common questions that we see, and we can see it in a variety of things. So for example, this is something that kind of passed me by a little bit at the time, but I do remember the, the hubbub about the Teletubbies. 
So if you remember Teletubbies, things they, they were huge back in the day and kind of like the early 2000s and things. But there was a huge thing about there are symbols in the Teletubbies. One of them, you know, they had these symbols on top of their heads. You can kind of see there and you can't see the one, but one of them had a triangle and people you know, went nuts because they said, well, that triangle represents homosexuality, you know, and so they're trying to influence small children to be gay or to accept, you know, homosexuality more freely by using that symbol, making by normalizing that symbol. People went nuts about that. And the different colors and the language that they used, the talk that, that they used all meant something to these people. And they were reading into all of this, uh, looking at the symbols that they were using there and saying what they represented. And that, you know, the, I mean, that was a huge, huge deal back in the, back in the day. People really went kind of nuts uh, about that. Whether it's accurate or not, I'm not really uh, taking a stance on that, I guess. I don't know enough about it, but Another example uh, is from uh, the the Dark Knight Rises, right? The Batman movie, the Dark Dark Knight, uh, or Dark Knight, I'm sorry. And uh, so, um, uh, one of the scenes, uh, one of the things that happened in that movie is that Batman put together this ability to monitor, like the entire city, monitor their their communications and things like that, so that he could identify in in his mind he could identify what was where. But his his uh, his kind of uh, cohort there, Lucius Fox, had a problem with that because he felt like it violated privacy. And there were some issues with that. So, and so beyond that, then people looked at that and said, oh, this is the director, Christopher Nolan. This is his effort to say that the government is overreaching. At that time, we, we you know, not too far after 9-11 had happened and we had all these things, you know, something called the Patriot Act, for example, that gave the government wider abilities to monitor, you know, and uh, cell phone communications and different things like that. And some people were concerned about is this overreach? Is the government going to be able to, is this, you know, 1984, the big brother monitoring us at all times and listening in and, and so forth. And, and, uh, and, and so, um, was that what the symbology represented in that movie? That was the question. Some people would say this symbol, this uh, symbol was used to represent, uh, and this represents the government reaching into our own lives, what Batman is doing essentially was what the government was doing. That's what they would say that that's what that's, those symbols represent that. Um, why were they chosen? They were chosen because Christopher Nolan, according to this theory, wanted to expose that and really highlight the government um, doing that to people. And the desired effect was that people would um, object to that and have concerns and really question whether or not the government needed all these powers and, and needed the ability to do all these things. And should we be more restrictive about what the government can do uh, in terms of monitoring these, these outlets and, and things? So, um, so people, I remember at that time read into that and, and said, well, this is what it represents. You know, again, there's, there's an argument for that to be sure. Um, but that's what rhetorical analysis is. It, it examines this and says, well, why is this in the movie? What is the director here trying to say with this or the, the, the musician? What are they trying to say with these, these lyrics and this song? And, and what are they trying to, what's, what effect are they trying to have with that? Hopefully this gives you a better idea of what rhetorical analysis is and, and some, you know, just skimming the surface here about what it is. But it's really fascinating and, and something that we can do virtually all the time. And now we can get too caught up in this a little bit at times, but, um, but I think it's important that we examine, you know, why were these choices made and, and what was the intended outcome uh, in choosing this symbol over others? If you have questions about rhetorical analysis or any of the other critical lenses that we're examining as part of critical media studies, please feel free to email me and I'd be happy to chat with you in that way. In the meantime, I hope you get out there and check out the symbols that you're seeing in these different artifacts. Why were these chosen? Why were these choices made? And you'll start to examine these types of things a little more closely as we, as we use rhetorical analysis and add that to our uh, tool belt of critical lenses that we use in critical media studies.